and today we're going to talk about all things good. That is, all things Cory good, which is to say some things that are actually pretty bad for the field of ufology. And I'm going to make an argument for that case as we explore everything I can tell you about what's going on with this so-called enigmatic secret space program whistleblower. So James Corey Good apparently appeared on the scene when he began posting anonymously to the Project Avalon forums. Uh, these are some pretty high quality uh, forums for people to discuss interesting experiences and matters related to frontier subjects. Corey began posting anonymously about some of his experiences uh, that he felt he had had as part of a government program. That uh, progressed to some audio recordings of Corey kind of describing his experience. And then at a certain point, it's claimed by Corey and, and his family that Corey's identity was, was revealed. And uh, he had no choice but to come, come out completely as, as one of these uh, secret space program whistleblowers. We can just move to the next stage, which is where Corey Good really began to explode, which is when he got his own show on the Gaia channel. And his partner for that show was David Wilcock. And the show is called Cosmic Disclosure. Now, let me just briefly describe what Cosmic Disclosure is. It's, it's the most popular series on the Gaia channel. It uh, pulls in approximately one to 200,000 viewers per episode. It consists of revelations uh, about the secret space program and a wide variety of other apparently or supposedly connected topics. The kinds of revelations that Blake from Third Phase of Moon would describe as, you know, absolutely mind-boggling, uh, grabbled And I'm sorry, Blake, I know I poke fun at you. I love you, man. Brent, make sure you keep him in line. There's been some incredible revelations on this show, Cosmic Disclosure, all pivoting around Corey Good. So how is it that Jimmy Good came by all of the information that he's revealed on Gaia's Cosmic Disclosure show? Before we get into the actual details, I think it's important to kind of set the stage of what Corey is claiming uh, to be. So according to Corey's wife and to Corey, Corey felt he, uh, he had always suspected that he had been part of some government intelligence program, but wasn't really sure what it was or, or really solid on a lot of the details. Then apparently he went in for some eye surgery uh, to fix a detached retina and he spent a really unusual amount of time in surgery and when he came out of surgery and woke up he could suddenly remember that he had been part of this elaborate secret space program that he had been recruited into what is called the 20 and back program where people are set to work in the secret space program in a kind of time bubble for 20 years and then at the end of their 20 year stint or contract they are age regressed and, and, and time regressed and brought back to exactly the moment that they signed up uh, and reinserted into society and they have their memories wiped. So that's what Corey was initially claiming and when he had these memories come flooding in apparently it caused depression, a lot of problems and some very friendly aliens came and wiped some of his memories so that he would be able to deal psychologically with with the sudden memories coming flooding back of, of having been involved in, in what, what he describes as a very evil a kind of a secret space program offshoot uh, called the Dark Fleet. So anyways, all that remained after this this curative mind wipe was his memories of his first 20 and back. Uh, and while he was in this program, he says he remembers uh, reviewing a database of information on something he called a smart glass pad, which is essentially an iPad that projects holograms. And based on his review of this information. Uh, he was coming on to the Gaia channel as part of this new show to disclose everything that he had learned during his time in the secret space program. He uh, would also be talking about ongoing direct communications he was having with a variety of alien species, uh, in particular a new species called the Blue Avians. But we're getting way ahead of ourselves here. Um, 
let's just say that the program Corey claimed to be involved in, he says, was so secret, it was uh, 38 levels above the President of the United States secret clearance. So let's get into the details of exactly what Corey claimed to be disclosing on the show. So let's start with the initial information that Corey provided that also just happens to consist of information that has been out in the public sphere for decades. And we'll kind of try to go uh, chronologically here as best we can. A secret breakaway civilization, a German secret society, began experimenting with UFO, a saucer type uh, craft in the early 20s and achieve some kind of breakthrough in anti-gravity levitation. They were contacted by um, some uh, what, what are called Nordic aliens, which have always, always been put out in the public sphere as the Nordic aliens. These are the aliens that look most like human beings, and they're very elf-like. They're very Tolkien elf-like, to a a analogize them. Uh, and they had apparently worked with these secret German societies to help them or to guide them. Uh, and then uh, they'd been kind of uh, fired, and uh, the secret German societies had taken, taken up with the evil reptilians who further helped them develop their anti-gravity craft. We get into the 30s, and then the Nazis uh, get interested in what's going on already. This secret society is uh, uh, sort of apart from what's happening with the Nazis, according to Corey and others. And the reptilians help this secret society produce these crafts. Certain elements of the Nazis join with them. They become part of the breakaway civilization. They build a base in Antarctica. They fly flying saucers out of the base. Um, essentially, as Germany is losing the war, uh, this secret society with their reptilian allies are kind of developing very rapidly and building up their capabilities from their secret base in Antarctica. Now on the U.S. side, uh, the U.S. recovers craft that have crashed in the 40s. They began experimenting and reverse engineering them, uh, sort of coming up with their own uh, progress in the anti-gravity sphere. And they are also approached by these Nordics to uh, help guide the development of the technology. And what happens is, you know, and this is related to the stories about uh, Admiral Byrd and Operation High Jump, is the U.S. takes a fleet down to Antarctica. They get blown out of the water and come back with their tails tucked between their legs. They realize the Nazis weren't defeated. No, they just went to Antarctica, and now they have flying saucers. So apparently... What happens after that is, as part of Operation Paperclip, the CIA recruit a whole bunch of ex-Nazis. Some of these ex-Nazi mad scientists are directly connected to this secret breakaway civilization in Antarctica. And uh, it is through this infiltration means that the Nazis and the reptilians infiltrate the United States deep state, began branching out like a cancer, uh, taking over all of the secret projects, gaining authority over them, and basically writing a very negative future for the United States and its flying saucer program. And basically it's given as the reason for all of the evil that tends to be associated with the deep state and UFO cover-ups and alien cover-ups. Now, the reptilians are apparently a race of aliens, the ones from outer space anyways, and we'll get to the other ones in a bit, that report themselves to a super creepy artificial intelligence entity from another dimension that's actually Lucifer or Satan, also known as Satan, which seeks to convert all living uh, biological matter into mechanistic kind of artificial intelligence life forms. Uh, and it's apparently consumed entire galaxies. And they're, you know, cutting a swath of destruction across the galaxy. And Earth, Earth is the latest target. The reptilians do the bidding of this evil artificial intelligence. Now the reptilians have their own subordinates. They have kind of foot soldier reptilians. They have overlord reptilians. They have uh, 
what Stephen Greer refers to as programmable life forms, and these are the alien greys. And sort of involved or within the orbit of all of this are the various secret space program groups and offshoots that came out of this infiltration of the deep state as they sought to uh, understand the alien technologies they'd recovered and and take advice from these uh, evil reptilians. This includes various forms of a secret space program, including a military industrial complex secret space program, which is kind of the house leak of the secret space program. They have kind of the the most dinky kind of uh, technology in terms of what they can do and where they can go. Then there's the Navy secret space program, which is a slightly more advanced secret space program uh, with more advanced spacecraft that can really get you from here to Mars in a blink of an eye, according to uh, many of the secret space program whistleblowers, including Corey Good. Then there's the Reptilian Dark Fleet program which is kind of an invention of Corey. It's sort of uh, the very top uh, need-to-know, in-the-know human agents sort of work with the reptilians in this fleet of spacecraft that look very reminiscent to the fleet uh, that is employed by Palpatine's empire uh, in the Star Wars fantasy world. So uh, anyways, these dark fleet space armadas venture out into the galaxy and conquer worlds and uh, very evil. This is the space program that Corey uh, claims he was recruited into. There's even an international corporate conglomerate, and these are all the corporations that know everything about the secret space program, and not only do they know about it, but they actively engage in trade with other alien species and have uh, dark uh, secrets such as a human slave trade, which includes human slave colonies on Mars and other places in uh, the solar system, and even outside of it in other star systems. Finally, we get to the ancient Martians, also known as the Pre-Adamites. And the story here goes that there was once a super-Earth, which uh, the remnants of which are the asteroid belt that exists between Mars and Jupiter. And Mars was actually a moon of this giant super-Earth. And there was some kind of war or accident, and the super-Earth exploded, creating the asteroid belt, and its moon Mars got kind of damaged in the explosion and sent into a new orbit. Uh, what remained of these pre-Adamites who lived on the super-Earth, the stories differ, but uh, in one case, they the moon was actually a, a spaceship that they took uh, from Mars uh, and they brought it to Earth, and then they all kind of went from the moon down to Earth and set up what became known as Atlantis in Antarctica. Other stories, you know, are that the pre-Adamites didn't come from the moon, but they just came in spaceships, you know, fleeing the destroyed Mars uh, super-Earth, and that they landed, uh, crash-landed in Antarctica and uh, set up Atlantis there. And as the story goes, the Illuminati, also known as the Cabal, that banker that came out recently, he was a, a whistleblower giving away the goods about uh, what happens at the, the highest levels of power. He claimed that only 8,500 people rule the world and that they get their power by sacrificing small children to Lucifer. Essentially, that's supposedly the Illuminati and they see themselves as the descendants of these pre-Adamites, these ancient Martians, or at the very least, they are their sycophants. This covers kind of the totality of the information that I'm aware of that was already in extant, that already existed, that Corey relayed to David Wilcock on the show, Cosmic Disclosure on the Gaia channel. This is all information that he claimed to have gotten from the smart glass pads, the uh, holographic iPads that are apparently issued to all of the semi-slaves that work in the Dark Fleet so that they can find out everything they'd want to know about everything going on with uh, the space program. Hey, why not? They're all going to have their memories wiped eventually anyway, right? But uh, so now let's get into some of the things that Corey supposedly introduced that were new. Uh, the very top of the list would be the blue avians. Now the blue avians are a species of alien that's never been described by anyone before. Corey's claim is that they came roaring into our solar system in around 2011. Uh, they have a technology that consists of 
small to large spheres, uh, spheres as small as a school bus, all the way to the to the size of a of a moon, all the way to the size of Jupiter. And when they came in with these spheres, they put a lockdown on the solar system so that no one could get in and no one could get out. And they said they were here to guide humanity through its ascension. Apparently, they'd been here before. Um, they'd screwed up big time, according to themselves, interacting directly with humankind and creating all kinds of problems, including evil religions and cults and uh, terrible things. And apparently had learned their lesson and were back one last time to try and help us defeat the reptilians and take our true place on the cosmic stage as ascended fourth density beings. Oh yeah, densities. I guess this is the point at which I should explain the various densities. Um, apparently we are third density uh, beings of the universe. The animals that we interact with are second density. Apparently a rock would be a, a first density. The fourth density are um, sort of these uh, aliens that are right above us, people who have ascended to this utopian next stage of awareness and harmony. Then there's fifth density, sixth density, seventh density, eighth density. Apparently ninth density is when you become one with the universe, or maybe that's tenth. Where's all this density stuff coming from? Well, it comes from the Law of One. The Law of One is a book that was written by what I can only describe as a bunch of hippie psychics in the early 80s who felt they were channeling the words of a very wise alien who had come to give them very valuable knowledge, spiritual knowledge, technological knowledge. And it's a real big thing for David Wilcock. It's something he's always thumping, this law of one, law of one, and talking about the densities and that these blue avians were sixth density, that the blue, the blue spheres that seem to be related to them are actually seventh or eighth density living beings. Um, and the idea was that these blue avians were the aliens that had communicated through channeling all of this esoteric information and spiritual information through the hippie psychics in the early 80s, which David Wilcock uh, really became enamored with as, I guess, what he sees as some master key to the secrets of the universe. So that's the blue avians. Now, Funny enough, the Blue Avians selected Corey Good to be their ambassador to humankind and basically convey their message to us so that we would uh, start to change from sort of negatively oriented or service to self, lost, uh, poor souls into service to others, very positive uh, souls. It, it sounds very nice. It's always a good message to hear someone say, you should be good to others and not so selfish. I think that's pretty common um, advice that we've heard from a lot of different religious and uh, philosophical leaders throughout history. One of the first statements that Corey made uh, on the Cosmic Disclosure show in reference to the Blue Avians and their instructions to him was that his prime directive is to make absolutely certain that he does not set himself up as some kind of religious leader or cult leader, that, you know, that kind of uh, spiritual movement that sort of pivots around one figure. That was his prime directive as stated by himself, I think right off the bat in the, in the first or second episode of Cosmic Disclosure. But anyways, uh, so the Blue Avians select Corey. Corey becomes their ambassador. Ambassador to what? Well, apparently there is a confederation of alien species. You know, you might ask yourself, with all these alien species floating around, why don't they ever blow the crap out of each other? Well, there's a treaty, don't you know? And it's a treaty as part of the Confederation of Alien Species. The United Nations building for them is the moon, and they all meet there. Uh, they have conferences. They discuss how things are going, resolve disputes, you know, very much like the United Nations. And Corey is the blue avian representative to that entire body of aliens. So very important post for Corey. And uh, I think that pretty much summarizes the blue avians. Now, six to nine months into his stint doing the Cosmic Disclosure Show on Gaia, 
Corey revealed an amazing new development, uh, and that was that he had made direct contact with a new species of apparent fourth density beings, but only they weren't from outer space. What they told him was that they were from the inner Earth. Now, I'm including this in new stuff because of the details and where I suspect they come from, but it's not new to hear stories about an inner Earth or that there are people who live under ground in the inner earth. As we all know, there's the classic journey to the center of the earth. There's many other stories like that. But Corey's version of the inner earth consists of a uh, utopian society of ancient humans who, uh, as communi communicated to Corey, had been around for millions of years. They represented past populations of humans that had ascended to fourth density as part of what David Wilcock describes as a regular 25,000 year cycle where the sun gives off this radiation burst and it burns all the bad people to a crisp, all the good people. They are transformed into these new bodies for uh, an explanation of, of that. See every doomsday chapter from pretty much every major religion of the past 2,000 years, but um, they are uh, transformed and, and they get new bodies, they become fourth density, they start to have psychic powers, and if they work hard enough and practice enough, they can levitate things and uh, do all kinds of amazing things. It represents a new chapter in, in a species development. And so these inner earth people, which, uh, you know, consist of various races, and they uh, also are divided up into castes. There's a priest caste, there's like a science caste, there's an administrative caste, a worker caste. And uh, they had decided that they too wanted Corey's help in this, uh, this ongoing saga of good against evil. And so they gave him a tour of their underground utopian cities, and they gave him access to all the information they had about the inner earth you know, revelations of various other inner earth species of humanoids and reptilians. And I really got to take a moment here to stop because with the revelation of the inner earth reptilians, I got to say that in Corey Good's world, there are a crap load of different reptilians. I mean, let's just quickly look at them. There's overlord reptilians from outer space. There's their foot soldiers then there are the programmable life forms that they use as kind of uh, errand boys. Uh, and then in the inner earth, there's, you know, reptilians that look pretty much like raptors, like dinosaurs. There's reptilians that look like reptilian cavemen. There's even reptilians ripped straight out of M. Night Shyamalan's movie Signs. Uh, every kind of reptilian you could probably conceive of is represented in this world. The inner earth humanoid people, uh, the elves, I like to think of them as elves, they use, according to Corey, cigar-shaped anti-gravity craft that can phase through solid rock. And, you know, Corey communicates with a priestess named Kari uh, directly when she portals him to the underground city for a powwow, or uh, simply through uh, what I can only describe as a telepathic Skype call, where Corey uses his powers as an intuitive empath to make contact telepathically with Kari. They have a little conference uh, and then go on with their day. The term Kori uses uh, to describe the inner earth people who are very reminiscent of Tolkien's elves is uh, he calls them the Anshar. That's apparently the, the name they call themselves. It's their race. And he also reveals that the Anshar are the same beings as the Nordics. So uh, these are all the same people. And he also claims that there are fake Nordics out there, people who seem to be Nordics, but they're actually working for the reptilians. You can tell because they have six fingers. So keep an eye out for those six fingers. Any of you people out there that think you're on the verge of being fooled by a fake Nordic Anshar. Now, the Mayans are another alien race, which Corey claims lived close by in terms of uh, galactic distance and share uh, over 90% of their DNA with human beings. The story goes that these Mayans rebelled against the reptilians themselves very recently uh, and ascended uh, to fourth density. And it's only been a few generations uh, since that occurred. 
these Mayans are supposed to have lifespans that are about 300 years. The implication here is that some of the South American civilizations were uh, worshipping uh, these guys who had come to Earth to kind of escape the turmoil in the war against the reptilians that was occurring back where they live. Uh, and when that was all resolved, you know, they left Earth and went back home. And those civilizations apparently obviously collapsed, not having their gods anymore to worship. That's the implication. It's never explicitly stated, but that's sort of what he's implying. Uh, anyways, these Mayans are very interested in Earth. They watch our uh, entertainment, listen to our radio, uh, are very concerned about our future. And uh, it was these friendly Mayan aliens that came to Corey's aid when he was flooded with traumatic memories of his time in the secret space program. And they wiped a good portion, according to Corey, of, of these dark memories so that he could uh, function normally and proceed with his mission of uh, saving mankind. Finally, the last component of all of this is the Cabal and the Alliance. So what is the Cabal? The Cabal are the Illuminati, the reptilians that they report to, all of the sycophants that supposedly report to the Illuminati, and all of their evil plans and all of the evil things that they have been working towards for the enslavement of mankind and their own profit. Now, the Alliance is supposedly a more recent group which has emerged, broken away, uh, turned in rebellion against the Cabal. And the Alliance also consists of various government, uh, governments and government players, corporate players, uh, people who have woken up and realized what they've been involved with has been something evil. They've decided to join the good guys. They've developed their own secret space program, their own craft and they stand in opposition to the cabal. And what Corey will do and what David will do is they will try and incorporate real world political and social events into this paradigm of the cabal versus the alliance. And they've described everything from high espionage type intrigue to uh, underground battles going on where Canadian Marines, by the way, there are no Canadian Marines, but anyways, Canadian Marines have been sent secretly into underground bases controlled by the cabal to uh, basically wipe out all the bad guys and even some of the aliens down there. Some of these soldiers supposedly so traumatized that uh, they've gone crazy and that this accounts for a lot of the uh, underground booms that people hear uh, as well as obviously uh, the, the, the intense tunneling that's been going on underground as the Cabal and their reptilian overlords have been tunneling out uh, bunkers for all of the super rich evil people to retreat to when uh, they unleash their uh, plans for world destruction. So, oh, I'm out of breath, you know, it's, it's a lot to try and convey uh, in a short period of time. I think that pretty much covers everything that, that Corey has claimed is going on. It's just a good kind of background and template for you to begin with before I get into everything that's wrong and that has been going wrong with this secret space program whistleblower almost right from the beginning. You might have recognized some terms as I generally relayed the story that Corey Good has told on the Cosmic Disclosure TV show. Uh, terms like a secret space program and breakaway civilization are certainly not new to ufology and not the invention of Corey Good. In fact, a lot of what Corey Good seems to use as the foundation, especially for the government conspiracy stuff, is the work of Richard Dolan. Now, Richard Dolan is a very level-headed and skeptical uh, UFO researcher. He is a historian, and when he began looking at this field, he didn't believe at all that it was possible for there to be grand government conspiracies, especially uh, dealing with secret anti-gravity craft, uh, technologies that would benefit mankind but had been withheld, possible interactions with alien species, the idea of a breakaway civilization uh, that could exist apart from the rest of us and have quite a different existence from the rest of us. 
Uh, but these were ideas that Richard developed over time as he continued his research into UFO sightings and the stories that various people had brought forward, people who had had abduction experiences, and especially the testimony of uh, very credible witnesses such as pilots, government officials, military officers. Richard has come to very tentative conclusions. He'll rate various types of evidence according to the probability that he believes it's genuine and uh, formulate very reserved uh, hypotheses of what could possibly be going on and really do the uh, responsible work of, of a researcher in this field. And Corey will take all of that work and use it as a platform upon which he places this ludicrous cartoon this Scooby-Doo story of, of the blue avians and the uh, inner earth and char and trying to pull in as many threads from as many other themes and classic secret alien conspiracy storylines that have existed out there for years and trying to weave it all together and anchor it with uh, Richard Dolan's uh, terminology. Even people who are familiar with the UFO research field were initially drawn in by Corey in the early days of his cosmic disclosure testimony because he used many of the same terms as Richard Dolan. So while Richard has always been someone obviously on the outside trying to look into something and, and come up with credible and careful theories and hypotheses about what might be going on. The initial excitement and, and lure, of course, was the idea that Corey was someone from the inside who was finally revealing the actual true and genuine detail uh, from within these programs. And when his testimony first began, you know, besides the unusual inclusion of this race, the Blue Avians, and his initial claims about the nature of his relationship with them, everything else that he was relaying was blending rational and solid UFO research with well-established sensational stories that have been put forth in the past, and then blending in his own uh, cartoon uh, with him in the leading role. Now, when I say he's doing this, he's doing this, I mean, I'm not absolutely saying that Corey has definitely planned out and executed every stage and every little detail of his story to unfold in the way that it's come out to us. It certainly looks like that's the case, but I can't be sure of that. So I don't have any absolute evidence showing that. And as I get to the end of this video, I have a few different ideas for what precisely could be going on. All I'm saying is that it's very obvious that this entire narrative has been very, I would say, clumsily constructed. But what it uses for a lot of its credibility is this underlying foundation of solid work that's been done by very credible people such as Richard Dolan. Let me take you through how a typical cosmic disclosure episode unfolds. There are basically two formats, and I'll go through both of them. The first main format for the show is with Corey Good sitting on the left and David Wilcox sitting on the right. David will ask Corey questions or prompt him with certain subjects, and then Corey will talk for a little while. And what always happens is that David will interject at certain points, and he will listen to something that Corey says and then say, Aha! I have also heard this information from my other secret space program sources. And uh, one of the ones he references most frequently is someone named Pete Peterson. And uh, so David will say, this is an amazing correlation. You are telling me this detail. And I also heard this detail from another source. And this is presented as amazing evidence that, you know, Corey's account carries some kind of credible weight. That's one format. The other format is where they bring a guest in to the show. The guest sits in between Corey and David, and the guest tells their story, gives their account, uh, presents whatever they think is their evidence. And then David will turn to Corey and say, so Corey, how does this match up with what you uh, understand? And then Corey will sit there as kind of an implied arbiter of truth and comment on how closely what the guest has presented matches with his own understanding of reality. So you can see right off the bat there are some serious issues with this 
way of vetting information. Uh, if you don't know who David Wilcock is, you might recognize him from the show Ancient Aliens. And he's a guest, a frequent guest and speaker on that show. And like a lot of the guests who speak on that show, David is uh, an affable, uh, seems like a very friendly man. But he is a walking X-Files poster. You know the poster that is up on the wall behind Mulder's desk, I want to believe? Well, David very much wants to believe. And when you want very badly to believe, you fall into a trap that's known as confirmation bias. And it's pretty clear, and I think David would probably admit this himself, that what David really wants to believe is that our solar system and every star in the galaxy goes through regular cycles of cataclysm that destroy all of the evil people on, on, on all of the planets within the solar system and raise all of the good people to a new reality, a new utopian awareness, a new chapter in, in, in the development of their species. First of all, there's absolutely nothing to suggest that information that a anonymous or not anonymous secret space program whistleblower has conveyed to David has not also been conveyed by that same person to other people, posted on forums. It really doesn't matter whether they're anonymous or not. David's uh, certainty that he retains information that has only been provided to him is highly questionable. And then, of course, there's the fact that it would be perfectly reasonable for two people or a group of people to all be accessing a similar store of information and all spinning their own stories. It's inevitable that some information that is told to an aggregate figure like David Wilcock by one person would be told to him by another person. It, it's not an indication of, of anything, and it doesn't confirm the credibility of any. Thing. You may be wondering how the universe determines exactly who is a good person and who is a bad person. Well, David Wilcock explains that his decoding of the law of one shows that there is a universal service to others power meter that must hit 51% before the sun triggers ascension. And Corey has confirmed this through the Blue Avians. And the battle continues. <laughs> I've chosen an interesting way to convey this concept to you, but I'm not exaggerating. This is not a joke. David Wilcock and Corey Good assure their followers that there is a service to others power meter that must reach 51% if a person is to ascend to the fourth density bonus round when the sun gives off its ascension solar flash. Now, the Blue Avians understand how this rating system works how the judgment is made as to whether something is service to others or service to self, but they've explained it to Corey and the rest of us in terms we can understand. Uh, one of the things you quickly begin to notice is how much of the detail in Corey Good's accounts seem to be drawn from existing fantasy works and, and films. Uh, there's uh, a lot of stuff borrowed from in terms of the metaphysical from Star Wars and the Lord of the Rings, there are characters that seem to be pulled straight out of Tolkien's universe. And uh, even some of the ships, uh, for example, the Dark Fleet motherships, uh, essentially look like Star Destroyers. And if you challenge uh, David Wilcock with this kind of information, his response is 
that all of these movies and all of these stories are a kind of partial disclosure where the um, motive is either to put the information out there in a fictional form so that if down the line certain uh, people who are in the know reveal classified information, the uh, authorities and, and, and the community at large will simply say, oh, that's from that movie. You stole it from that movie. That's not real. And then the other kind of partial disclosure he claims is where members of the Alliance who have managed to infiltrate Hollywood are, are inserting actual disclosure for the benefit of everyone if you just look closely and pay attention. And he would cite, for example, Captain America Winter Soldier as an example of that. But it, it's obviously much more likely that certain so-called whistleblowers or people who claim to have incredible knowledge were unconsciously or quite consciously influenced by certain depictions in film and, and fantasy. From what I can see, that certainly appears to have been the case with the Law of One book, which, as I mentioned before, was supposedly channeled by so-called psychic hippies in the early 80s and describes a metaphysical reality that's pulled straight out of the plot of Star Wars, which was at the height of its initial hype at the time. The Law of One book quotes from the Infancy Gospel of Thomas, which is an apocryphal book of the Bible that has been thoroughly discredited as a fraud. Although I'm open to the idea that it could be legitimate, but the point here is these are the types of influences that would have an impact on hippies in the early 80s who are searching for hidden knowledge, uh, looking in places outside the lines for hidden wisdom, then laying down, putting themselves into a trance, and believing they're channeling the wise words of an alien being, when in fact what they are doing is dictating their own subconscious to uh, a person who is listening and writing it all down. But the unfortunate effect of having David Wilcox sit there and act as though he is kind of a sober, impartial arbiter of information, confirming that which is true and discarding that which is false, it can give people who may not be particularly discerning or, or, or familiar with, with this field, this impression that they are receiving amazing uh, and confirmed what David would call quote-unquote intelligence about the secret space program and alien conspiracy cover-ups. And this is very unfortunate because it contributes greatly to the uh, false impression that there's some real meat here. The real tragedy about all of this is that there are genuine UFO and alien researchers that come into that show. They sometimes present intriguing evidence, and all of that evidence and everything that they say is tainted uh, by the, the format and the characters involved, the way that they handle the information and the claims that they make. If there is any real truth or meat in any of what these people who come onto the show are saying, it is lost deep, deep down uh, a hole of, of confirmation bias and wishful thinking. It, it makes sort of the entire endeavor a, uh, a lost cause for researchers. Now, although there are all kinds of different people who can get sucked into the Corey Good Vortex, uh, I think I want to focus in on two main kinds of, of, of people I've noticed who tend to get drawn into this. The first are, are people who are very open and searching for answers, but unguarded. And a, and a very typical example of this is somebody who's recently discarded uh, a rigid dogmatic belief system that might be theist or atheist. Uh, a lot of people find at a certain point in their lives they've been adhering to a very absolutist, materialist doctrine, and they'll discard that and go, go searching for, for new answers. Uh, now, there's nothing wrong with doing that. I think everyone goes through a kind of evolution uh, throughout their life. But uh, one of the dangers of, of that is when you open yourself up, uh, if you also drop your guard entirely, uh, you become susceptible to being drawn into false movements, um, cynical, opportunistic ploys designed to exploit people uh, and take advantage of their good nature. I think the other type, which is you know not as, as common, but certainly a type I've noticed, are 
the kind of opportunistic, cynical types that want to hitch their wagon to the rising Corey Good train. Now, what are Corey's kids? Well, Corey's kids are apparently a small group of young people who very early on announced their devotion and commitment to Corey, his uh, message, his story, and his mission. Now, there's been some disagreement over who came up with the term Corey's kids. Uh, a few days ago, one of the Corey's kids came out and said that they did not come up with that term. It was the first time I've ever seen one of them say that. Uh, apparently, the claim is that the dark journalist invented that term. But regardless of where it came from, it does very well describe the group of young people that have decided to devote themselves or attach themselves to the Corey Good movement. But I want to focus in on two of the main uh, key members of the Corey's Kids group. And they are Jordan Sather, who has a YouTube channel called Destroying the Illusion, and uh, Teresa Yanaros, a.k.a. Tessa Gianni, who has a YouTube channel called Divine Frequency. And I actually I choose them because I think they're excellent examples of both types of people. And I'm going to start with Jordan. Now... Let me just make this clear. Everything I'm about to say about Jordan is my opinion, but I really don't need to say too much. All I think I really need to do is encourage you to go to his YouTube channel and watch any random three videos he's uploaded in the last month. Try and watch them from beginning to end and tell me if you don't think that this is someone that strikes you as, as an opportunistic narcissist who is hoping to hitch his brand which is something he, he cites quite frequently, his brand, to, to the Corey Good brand and marketing campaign in the hopes that this will bring him success and uh, noteworthiness. Now, the other uh, person that's uh, kind of a key figure of, of the Corey's kids is uh, Teresa Yanaros. Now, I think Teresa is a great example of the more common type of person who gets sucked in to the Corey Good black hole which is somebody who has uh, recently let go of a kind of a rigid system of belief and is kind of open and exploring and trying to learn new things, but is quite clearly co also completely unguarded in their discernment. And uh, I think Teresa is, is a great,